Hi, haters. Hi, haters. I'm Kayla. I'm Soda. And this is We Couldn't, Couldn't Be nicer. nicer. We're back. <laughs> We're back. Why are we back? We're back because last night I rewatched, and it was your first watch. I wanted you to see it. Hitman, starring Glenn Powell on Netflix. And you really liked it. I was rewatching it because I didn't love it the first time. I liked it more the second time. That's good. Yeah. I'm glad I could inspire you. Yeah, it was more fun with you, and also now knowing that it wasn't an action film helped. What is Hitman about? Hitman is about, it sees Star of the Summer, Glenn Powell, as Gary Johnson, a professor of psychology and philosophy, who gets tangled up with the New Orleans Police Department as the quote-unquote hitman, which is he has to help incarcerate people who are looking to hire a killer. And suddenly one day, someone tries to hire them, and that that's somebody is a special lady. He's like, you know what? I'm not going to accept your money. I will, however, start to fuck you. And then mess happens. Mess always happens. I will say that this is based partially on a true story. Gary Johnson was a real man. Glenn Powell approached Richard Linklater with this idea in 2020, I think. Richard Linklater was like, brother, I read this in 2001 when you were 12. And they workshopped it and they put something together. They found a movie. That movie was Hitman. And it's cool because Kayla and I, our first little movie moment was Richard Linklater's Before Trilogy. Yeah. That we watched all in one day. And that's what we said was going to be our first podcast episode. And it's not. But it's not. Challengers came out. Things happen. <laughs> so we we like we like Linklater. We, yeah, I think he's like in my top five. Like, nice. Of directors. Like, yeah, School Rock and the Before Trilogy. <laughs> and Dazed and Confused. These are all things that... That I like the concept of boyhood, the concept of time. He's a little freak about time, mm-hmm. so am I. Yeah, <laughs> I think about it a lot, and I know that he does too. So my thesis question is, Kayla, when is it okay to fuck your teacher? When he's a professor and it's Glenn Powell. Mm. He should also, you know, be single. You shouldn't have a family, which he doesn't in this movie. Which is why that's something. That I thought about the entire movie from the very beginning. I was like, yeah, this comb over, I'm seeing through it. I don't, that doesn't matter to me. The jorts to the knees don't matter. The little button down, short sleeve, doesn't matter. The Honda Civic. That's a reason too, if anything. I had a Honda Civic, so I know my way around one. Ooh, what else do you know? (laughs) So him being a teacher is obviously very instrumental to the story because it cuts back and forth between him having these lectures and how this philosophical idea of the persona and the question of can people change, but also because he has this scene with his ex-wife in which she poses that question, talking who she's also involved in psychology, and she asks if he thinks that people can change and he doesn't believe that they can. So I ask you, do you think people can change? I think that people can change, but I kind of agree with the movie that most people don't change for themselves. They do need a little push, a little catalyst, a little spark. I think that people can change. I don't think it's, I don't think it's crazy that he doesn't think that he can't. I remember you would ask me, you were like, I wonder why he is so stern that people can't. And I think part of that should be age and also divorce. He is a divorcee. He is, you know, upwards of 33 years old. And it is like, as a 23 year old, 10 year difference, which just a member baby, not a problem. I have to believe people can change because I don't want to be this person for the rest of my life. I don't want to think that everyone I know is going to stay this way forever because there's so much room for growth. But then is there a point where you get to a certain age and you're like, no, I'm probably not going to change. You know what? I don't want to. And so you make the conscious choice to not change because you're comfortable, because you're isolated, because you don't challenge yourself and you don't meet people who challenge you to change. Yeah. Until you do. I like the idea of change as a choice. I think that, you know, we should always strive to be better, that there's always things that you can do better. 
pick a new hobby and learn, you know, I don't think we're ever complete. So I think that translates into change, but I don't think that you necessarily have to think about it as changing yourself. I think that change is a strong word that has a connotation of the previous you isn't good enough. And he says, where does, where does the old you go? You know, and his wife, his ex-wife is like, you're dumb. I don't know. It doesn't really go anywhere. It's still you. I, I like that. And I, I like that he does change and he does change for the better. And he take back what he learns from being these other characters and specifically his character, Ron, and how that betters him. And then we see how that affects his teaching and how that affects how he stands up for himself throughout the movie. When he is speaking to his ex-wife, at this point he has already begun to dabble in the hitman work. And so he says that he sees it as like field research because he's getting into these people's psyche and he's also exploring different personas to figure out how to get into these people, how to get these people's trust and to really meet them at their level. And he says that you have to have a certain kind of love in order to kill, to want someone that you care about so strongly, whether it's love or hate, to be killed. And how she points out that he kind of lacked that passion in their relationship, that she could not imagine him doing anything so extreme for her. And so that's what we get set up with when he does meet (sighs) Madison. And he is Ron, who is this sexy, confident, kind of one of the more grounded personas that he has in comparison to these other caricatures that he plays for these people that are funnier. You know, he kind of approaches Ron in a much realer way when he meets Madison. Two things about Ron. One's a question. I'll start with the statement. I think that Ron is him in real life. Ron's very Texas. Ron's very, I don't know. I was like, this is just, this is the Glenn voice. Yeah. He's, he's, yeah, he's putting the charm on. Um, and why do you think he chose Ron for her? That's a great question. He looks at her social media and it's this young woman, but it's not the first young woman because for the other young woman, he chose the American psycho uh, Patrick Bateman persona. But she was weird. Right. So then here's a woman and he sees that she is in a relationship. He sees that she has no father in the picture. He kind of just comes in it with this coolness and I don't know I don't know why he like I don't know if maybe he does find her attractive in those first moments and so he's like okay I'm gonna be an attractive version of myself if maybe she is kind of low-key and so like nothing about her is particularly odd so he's not going in with odd first he's going in with low-key first and for him low-key means sexy and then once he meets her he relaxes into it more Mm -hmm. and they fall into this banter really quickly. Yeah, they do. I think that's, I think that's interesting. I think subconsciously he does really like her and he maybe does not make um, the right persona choice necessarily. Someone comes up to me and a young woman wants to kill her husband. Why would I be sexy? Mm -hmm. It doesn't, wouldn't you want someone that seems like safe? Not not safe, but just, like, this guy knows what he's doing, you know? Like, at some point, he does, like, a little Boston accent. Like, you know, like, something a little more that's like, oh, yeah, he kills people. But he doesn't give that. And I think that that was kind of sub- a subconscious slip on his end where he was, where he did find her attractive. And that's why he creates Ron. Because I don't think Ron necessarily fits for what she was and was looking for you know true because when they talk she quickly forgets what they're even there to do he says she says what do you do (laughs) because they're they're flirting for so long she says what do you do and then she's like oh yeah that's really interesting that it's not the right choice do you want to talk about madison glenn powell if you're free i'm free and maybe we can have a little meet you and I can teach you how to write a woman because, you know, this is your first soiree and it's no from me. And I believe in you. Yeah. 
I believe in you. I believe that I could fix this. Right. As over dinner. <laughs> yeah, I, I, so like I said, I didn't love this movie the first time. And even upon the rewatch, Madison as a character doesn't really work for me. What kind of name is Madison? For one, I cannot imagine my Ecuadorian mother ever uttering the word Madison. It's two so, letters, two letters, and it was a real Hispanic name. Yeah. And we talked about this that in Louisiana, how they say Marisol, 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 Mary, and then they call her Mary, and then no soul, soul, soul would be good. cute, but they soul would be cute. Yeah, like Soledad. So yeah, Madison doesn't work. For strike me. one. Even Miranda could work. I was almost called Miranda. 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 See, it works fine. What the fuck? Anyway. <laughs> The second thing that doesn't work for me really begins with the fact that we have to understand that Madison is a victim of domestic abuse. Yes. We don't know the extent of how violent her abuse is, but we know from the first introduction we see of her that her diet is restricted, her appearance is restricted, her work life is restricted, and so... I feel like her character kind of begins to fall apart, beginning with how simply her leaving him is handled. It's very breezy. Everything about her is very breezy. And you almost wonder, did you have no female friends in your life to tell you to leave him? Because that's all it took for you. It took one interaction with this guy to be like, you know what? I should leave him. And what does leaving him look like? Moving down the block. Moving down the block. You live in the same place? You're going to the same clubs? She's Maddie from the block. <laughs> it's, it feels like nothing. It feels like no big deal the way that she leaves him. It feels like no big deal when she begins to see this hitman. And that's kind of where you begin to have issues. Yeah, so I believe women all the time. Do I believe her is rough. And it's not her fault. It's the writing. So I blame, I, I blame them. I, yeah. And I want to believe her. And I, you know, I don't know if the script believes her at a certain point because of how inconsistent she is and how minute her past seems to be. Well, her distant past, you know, this was the other day. So like you said, she moves and at, at their first meeting, she makes the point to say that he doesn't let me work. So we don't know how much money that he gives, that she gives him, but he says, take the money and leave. But she has no ties to the city, so it's not really apparent why she stays there, because she has no job, she has no family, like it was just her mom, so I... No am, job, no family, 16 in the middle of Miami. <laughs> wow, this is a good one. My big thing is that He's a hitman, yeah? You're a victim of domestic abuse. Why are you... I can understand you might be attracted to someone who can protect you. Okay, you're in the same city as your husband uh, who's abusive. You're with someone who can definitely kill him. That That is different. But the way that you are so willing to to divulge so much to this man that kills people from all you know, is just very not consistent with someone who would be afraid of men because they were abused by their husband for the last however long. So that's super concerning, but she plays this role very sexy. She turn, she flips a switch and it's, it's, it's sexy time. Like she's putting the moves on him. She's seducing him, which is also very interesting. I don't, you, you know, I don't know a lot of people that, like, escape domestic violence and are, like, ready to bone the hitman of all people. And then consistently bone him in such an isolated way is so okay never going to his place, staying in her place. He sets very strict, albeit red flag rules, because he is lying to her. He says it has to only be here. It has to be strictly sex. I, you can never come to my place. You can never see what I do. You can't ask where I am. Like, those are the boundaries he sets. 
And again, she thinks he's a real person, a real hitman, not someone pretending to be a hitman. So are you? Why are you not scared? She he has free reign to her home. He has access to her at all times. And she says, "Yes, this is what I want." And that is alarming. Yeah, and I think everything really begins to fall apart in her characterization when the movie takes a turn and that they're at this club. She runs into her husband again, and then we see her fear again. We see her like she she does start to freak out, and you're like, okay, so she is a victim. Like like this is real for her, and she does feel. But again, the minute he pulls the gun out, she's like cocky, and I'm like, what crazy switch up? Like he as in Glenn, uh, Glenn Powell, right? His character. Um, Ron pulls out the gun, and she feels safe. But again, it's like a switch being pulled, and then. When she her, feels more than safe, I'm sorry. She's aroused. She's aroused and she's boastful. She's like, yeah, he's a hitman, bitch. He's a professional. He's a professional. <laughs> when Ron finds out that her husband has now is interested in putting a hit on her, and he goes to tell her, hey, your husband wants to wants me to kill you, I lose it here because her reaction is not the reaction of a fearful domestic abuse victim. She gets silly. She says, are you going to kill me? Once again, we see her equate violence with sexuality and arousal, and she doesn't care. She's like, no, like, I got you. This is fine. And I think it would have been way more effective and way more realistic had we seen her break down in this moment. Because... What happens after this, what eventually surprises Ron slash Gary, is that she is going to kill her husband in cold blood. So I'm supposed to believe that in between this scene and when we see her again, she develops the courage, strength, and tenacity, and also the discipline and commitment to murder her husband while he's asleep. And that is not giving from this scene. If we had seen her break down, express this genuine fear of being under this man's thumb, maybe I could believe you because it's not fair that we get to see Ron slash Gary. We get to see his switch flip in that he is going to go to murder to protect this relationship. But her crazy moment happens off screen and I don't believe it. I don't believe it. It's And the crazy part is, is... Richard Linklater did think about writing this movie when he saw the original article in 2001 and he couldn't put it together. And the way that they built the script was around this woman because uh, Gary Johnson, the actual person, said that he had met a woman who wanted to kill her husband and that was the only person that he didn't believe was an actual killer. And so they built this movie around her and she's so poorly thought out. And it begs the question, is this racism? And I don't want to think that about someone I want so bad and someone I like so much. But I don't know. It does give very spicy Latina does whatever she wants. And I don't believe they would have written a white woman like this. And not even a little bit. And putting on a script doctor hat, I think that, again, yeah, if you are going to leave your husband who you are afraid of, you're not going to move down the street and run into him at a bar or risk running into him anywhere. Um, You are going to leave the city, I hope, maybe the state. So I wish that maybe she did have, you know, a tether to the city and maybe she did leave and, you know, she finds her way back to the city and she seeks out Ron because he can protect her while she's doing whatever is tying her back to the city. And I think that if they had portrayed her as someone who was fear, actually fearful of her husband consistently and still, and still fears him, you know, there's a moment where she's like, Hey, I can't let him rule my life anymore. I really like Ron. I really like my life and myself when I'm not with him. I can't cry over him anymore, you know? So if instead he goes to her and she does break down when he's like, your husband tried to hire me to kill you. 
that's the moment where she's like, hey, no, he taught me how to use a gun. I am going to go confront my husband and I'm going to fucking kill that guy. But we don't see that. And we don't have any motivation for her to leave and kill her husband. There's none of that there. She just wanted to be single. It really does read as crazy. And I don't think it's fair because even when he's being crazy in the final scene where he does decide to help her finish off Jasper, who was another cop who has caught on to their bullshit and knows that, that she killed her husband and knows that he's helping her get away with it. For him, it's like, okay, this is the passion that was missing that, that I was talking about with my ex-wife that being so passionate that I'm going to kill to protect someone I love. And it's, I think it would even be interesting that had we seen her kill her husband, or again, they don't want to because they want to be a twist, um, that like, if she is motivated to protect what she has, if like Ron is even around, maybe it like he's there and it's a confrontation and like she's doing it for him, like, or for her to be with him. You know what I mean? Like, again, linking the, this intensity of passion, but we don't see that. We don't see any intense passion. We just hear about it and it's just used for this twist. And it's like deprives her of really even being linked to what the plot is trying to get at. It yeah. keeps giving him more than she's getting. For sure. And again, she's the, supposedly the key to the whole script in general, which is just really, yeah, just really surprising to me. And I think even if a flashback could have worked in a way, if they wanted the twist to be so important, but still kind of like give her some sort of, justice and continuity and sense to help you understand how she got there to help you understand how she got there you know like because if she could have killed him why didn't she just kill him why did she hire a hitman to kill him how did she get there sex i tend to agree (laughs) you kept mentioning the calculation behind her and i think that's another layer because she says that she doesn't believe in divorce and that really bothered me as a joke. As a joke, but she, but also it comes up because he asks her while they're on their little date, after they see him at the club, they go get ice cream because that's what you do after you see your scary husband, you go get ice cream up the block. And she says, do you see a ring on my finger? And he takes that as an answer that yes, she's divorced now. Ridiculous. And when he sees the husband who is trying to hire him to kill her, he mentions that he's going through a divorce and he can't do it himself because obviously he'd be the number one suspect. And he interrupts him to say, You're, is this divorce still happening? Like, are you still in the middle of the divorce? Well, yes. Because- <laughs> obviously. And it, it, you know, it gives like, maybe she's not cooperating in the divorce. She says she doesn't believe in it. Did she, did she just want her husband dead? Because she doesn't believe in divorce? Was was this the whole thing? Like, it, and the level of calculation that she has is, that's not far-fetched. The life insurance thing is crazy. Like, them adding the life insurance policy bit that she has, that he that he did have her his life insurance bumped up to a million dollars to go to his wife, like... Again, it brings into like, okay, so you were for real about getting your man killed, however way that may have happened. And then also that you could so quickly internalize all the advice that this hitman gave you that he didn't know he was giving you to get your husband, to kill your husband yourself. Is like, I understand. I like how it sets up her being a liar and her being a performer. I like that. I think it's that's consistent about her, that it goes from like their banter about being detectives to their sexual role play to the, to the penultimate scene of them pretending while the cops are listening in and she has to deny and he's coaching her through that. And so like that works out for me. But again, her insisting on making everything violent sexual and then also somehow having such great Amy from Gone Girl Foresight to effectively murder her husband. I'm just like, who are you? Is it is it is it stated that she's the one that changes the life insurance? Or th- we're supposed to infer that her fuck is like, oh, that does make me look bad. I that's how I read it. I didn't read it that she had done it, but that's also interesting. 
and then she kills, <laughs> then she helps kill the cop. If the the cop's passing out. We don't know what the fuck's happening to him. And she's like, I drugged his beer. <laughs> she doesn't laugh. I'm laughing. I, I was shocked because, again, this woman doesn't give killer. And it definitely doesn't give, oh, my God, I'm going to drug his beer. Why are you letting strange-looking white men into your home? You are a victim of the, your victim. It's just confusing. And it, that's what bothers me with the movie is that, like, as far as I know, she she will strike again. Like, don't make me say it. Don't make me bring out the word. Don't don't make me call her a manic pixie. Manic pixie dream, girl. Manic pixie dream Latina. <laughs> it's giving the M word. It's giving the M word. Um, what happened to his cats? Did she kill the cats? Now I believe she drugged the cat. I bet you she did. She drugged those fucking cats. Where did he put them? And now they have two dogs and two kids. My experiment professor, who I love but am not tempted to seduce, once said that one convenience in a film is still one too many. Like, fine, write it, it's still one too many. So any more is still way too fucking many. And my issue is that this movie has three conveniences, back to fucking back to back. It's fucking crazy. Bam, no, bam, bam. Insane. Number one, she gets there... They, as they're walking out of Virgos, he is walking into Virgos. Her husband is walking in as she is walking out with Gary. Insane. Immediately, the scene after immediately, they go to get ice cream. Who is there as they're eating their ice cream? Fucking Jasper, the crooked cop who was going to fuck all the shit up. What happens then? Third one, almost immediately after that is, whoa, we, wait, what, we, we couldn't get the title warrant. We, we have to audio only talk to this guy who wants a hitman well i don't have any time to prep who is this guy it's the husband what is what on earth what on earth just happened in the script richard linklater you know better you know better which leads me to believe this was glenn's idea and you let him drive the boat glenn you're so sexy i love you we can fix this second sound bite is so i when i went to sundance this was playing there I obviously couldn't even dream about getting it. It was so popular. But after it came out of Sundance and it broke that it was going to come out on Netflix, people were very upset because fuck streaming. Do you, where do you stand on that? Do you wish it had come out in theaters? How do you feel? I think that it, timing-wise, no, I don't think it would have done necessarily well from in theaters earlier this year. I think that like, yeah, everybody liked anyone but you. Like, no, actually, nobody I liked didn't. nobody liked anyone but you, but they liked him in it, and they liked the the kind of hoopla surrounding it. But I still don't think that was enough for him. I think that we kind of fell in love with him on this press tour for Twisters, and Twisters itself, so fucking sexy. Wow. If you feel it. Mm. So I think that if this had come out, come out in theaters you know, maybe late the summer after Twisters, it would have done pretty well. But before that, no, I don't think it's, I don't think it's doing well theater wise, but he has the star power. And I think that everything he does from now on should come out in theaters because I will be seeing it both ways. I understand how maybe it's not like a cinematic experience, which is what we're seeing people need to have now in order to go to the movies. Like, it has to be this whole event. It has to be a Barbenheimer. It has to be a Twisters 40X in order to get the masses to go. And, like, there's an argument of, like, okay, well, it's not really, like, an action film. It's not, like, the biggest cinematic moment. So it can handle being at home. But it does bother me that it is such a sexual movie and sex is such a powerful part of it. And we're not getting sex in theaters. We are getting Twisters, 40X, spoilers, no kiss in theaters. And that bothers me that, like, we have to push sex to the home. Glenn Powell is the future. And I do think part of a movie doesn't have to have action in it if there's cinematic elements in it. So the, cin the cinematic elements for this movie is watching it in the context of liking Glenn Powell so much, which is why I think... If it were to come out in theaters, it would have to come out after. And you, the cinematic experience is writing the star power of the star of the film, i.e. Glenn Powell. Bring back people we like to watch on screen. Glenn Powell should win an Oscar 
for imitating Christian Bale as Patrick Bateman. That was fantastic. And that little British thing he did, crazy. He's crazy. He's 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 it. He's our guy. And I'm really excited and I hope he doesn't disappoint me. Adria Arjona, who plays Madison. Marisol? Mar- Marisol. Um, who plays her, like, she is very sexy. Very sexy. And I, I'm a proud bisexual, like, I'm looking at both of them, and I would have, and I know that, like, bisexuals, let them have their moment on the big screen. Not at home. And that was, that was Hitman. That was Hitman. If you feel it. Yeah. Redacted. Bye, haters. Bye. <laughs> Bye, haters. <laughs>